I have an unusual job. I am the Chief Medical Examiner of St. Croix County. And in that role, I have been told by judges that nobody wants you at their door. No one wants you at their home. Nobody wants you to even talk to you. So it takes a special person to work in death investigation. So let's talk a little bit about St. Croix County. St. Croix County is right across the river from Stillwater, and we are part of the St. Croix River Valley. Our population is about 86,000. In 2015, we had 534 deaths. Of those, 170 warranted a full death investigation because they were unwitnessed, unexpected deaths. Of those, nine were suicides, two were homicides, 21 were accidental, and five were ruled undetermined. It's also interesting to note that in St. Croix County, 120 people every day on average are actively dying through hospice registration. Death is a part of our life. In St. Croix County, the average person who completes suicide is a 40-year-old white male college educated. In our accidental deaths, 80% of the accidental deaths, deaths have alcohol or drugs as a contributing factor. As a medical examiner, I see it all from beautiful, loving scenes to those where families are in avoidance, not sure what's going on, not prepared for the life circus, circle, excuse me. And in a lot of times, what I see is the inconvenience of death. As a medical examiner, I also understand the seriousness of death, and I want you all to just kind of pause with me, and let's get a kind of where we are. Talking about death is scary. Talking about death relates to each of us. Talking about death will affect everybody in this room, because this is one race we're not going to win. We are all going to die. But have you had these conversations with your families? Death is the normal powder of life. It is the great equalizer. I want to take you on a journey on what my day is as a death investigator. Usually what happens is a 911 call goes into our dispatch center. When that call comes in, all the appropriate services are sent out. And once the person has been biologically con con considered dead, they then call the medical examiner. I contact dispatch. Dispatch gives me a brief synopsis of what's going on. I then contact the officer or hospital or wherever this incident is happening just to get another view as to what is actually going on. I drive directly to the scene where I do a scene overview when I get there to make sure that everybody is safe and secure. From there, the officer, doctor, or whoever is the person in charge of that scene then gives me an up-to-date synopsis of to what is going on. I am then taken directly to the body where I photograph the body, examine the body, pronounce death, and then the human part starts. Now I have to go talk to the family. I have to get the history of what happened. I have to communicate with them everything that's going to happen from here out. We have to talk about organ and tissue donation. We have to talk about medical history. And we have to talk about the funerals. So let me talk to you about a couple of cases that we had and how different people handle death. For example, I was at a scene of an elderly woman who was in her 90s who passed away unexpectedly. By the time I got there, her adult children were there. They were all grief-stricken and shocked by the fact that their mother had died on that particular day because none of us prepare for that. As we were going through and getting all the medical history and everything that I needed to work on my case, I brought up the topic of the funeral home. Immediately at that point in time, all the, lot, the adult siblings whipped out their cell phones. And they started looking at their schedules. Could this death fit into their busy schedules? Did this death fit into 
the ball games that were going on, the family trips that were going on, all the other social events that were happening in our life. Because this family had never, ever talked about death. It is imperative that we talk about death because, remember, it's not about you. It's about everyone you leave behind. They're the ones that are going to be grieving. They're the ones that aren't going to know what to do. An idea that I'm talking about is talking about death, and let me explain why. Once this family could not schedule their funeral, what happened is this person went to cremation, and that person's cremains stayed at the funeral home. They never did plan a funeral for her. And if any of you have read the Minneapolis Star Tribune last month, there was an article about all the unclaimed cremains in our local funeral homes. This is something that's happening throughout our community. This is happening throughout our country. And it's because we don't talk about death. So my idea is, let's talk about it. You know what you want. You know what you don't want. So it's about you. So now let me take you on to a journey of someone who did talk about it. I was again called out to an unexpected death of an elderly person. When I got to the scene, I was met by this woman who was a lovely woman. And when I walked into the house, I could feel what was going on. I could feel the love and the beauty of the journey that had just been finished by this person. She took me into the house and we talked about their life of her and her husband. They had been married for over 70 years. She says to me, come and see this. So we walked into the porch. And it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this and experienced it. But this porch had this long table on it. And at this table was 30 or so chairs and every single chair was different. And I'm like, can you please tell me about this? I'm, I'm a little confused. And she's like, this is what brought my husband and I joy. We traveled the world, and we found a chair for every member of our family. And every member of our family, whether they're here or not, when we sit down at the table as a family, we are together. From there, she said, I want to show you something else. At this point, I really internally thought I want her to be my grandma, but I just kind of <laughs> kept on, I kept on going. And we went into the living room, and as we were in the living room, I passed him. In bed with him was his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. His children were around. They were laughing, they were crying, they were talking. They knew exactly what was going on. We went into the living room and there was three picture windows and they were pretty large picture windows. And she pulled down the shades of each picture window and she explained to me how every night she would face the, her husband's bed towards the picture window because on the shade she had painted a scene from somewhere else in the world. And every night they would talk about their travels. This family knew exactly what they wanted. They knew exactly what was going to happen, and they planned it appropriately, and that family was able to grieve in a healthy way and to move on with their life journeys, enjoying and embracing the memories that their father, grandfather, husband, and great-grandfather had been a part of their life. So I want you to think about it. What do you want at your memorial service, your celebration of life, your funeral? Whatever it is, what do you want? Who do you want to talk? What do you want to have for songs? What do you want to have to eat? What is it you want? Because remember, the persons that are involved that are the most grief-stricken are not going to have the information. They're just doing the best they can to plan your funeral. And you are the one who has the power to do this for them. So my idea is write it down, put it in a drawer next to your DNRs and your DNIs, and just when it happens, it happens. Thank you.